Welcome to Crossroads. I'm your host, Joshua Phillip. Today we have Justin Haskins. He's with the Stopping Socialism Project at the Heartland Institute, and he's here to talk to us about socialism. So, Justin, sure. great to have you on. Thanks for having me. And I, I know you just published a book called Socialism is Evil. Yeah, not hiding how I feel about it at all. I, I assume the that's the conclusion of the book. That is the conclusion of the book, yes. We were just talking about how never in a thousand years did I ever imagine that I would have to be talking about trying to explain why socialism is bad. That's right. But here we are here we having are. to talk about why socialism is bad. Go figure. So, tell us about the project you run then. Right, yeah. So at the Harlan Institute, we have a Stopping Socialism project. It's dedicated entirely to trying to get younger people especially, but uh, we really reach everybody. Um, to understand the dangers of socialism historically, but not just from an uh, economic perspective, also from a moral perspective. That's really what I'm most interested in. Because one of the things that we found is when you started talking to people about socialism, and you would say things like, well, look at Venezuela, and look at the Soviet Union, and look at China, and look at you know Zimbabwe, look at all these places where it's failed, they would say, well, yeah, but we're not those kinds of, so we can do it better, just put us in charge. They messed it all up. And what we realized was, okay, even if that's true, and it's not, uh, there are still serious moral problems with it, even if it works, and it never works, but even if it could work, there'd be all these moral problems. And so that's when we started focusing on this idea that socialism is evil. Well, that's, that's something we talk about on this show quite a bit, actually, is that socialism is not just an economic system. Exactly. And it's, it's, it's actually really unfortunate that it's often only debated as an economic system. Socialism and communism were used mostly interchangeably until about 1917 with uh, Lenin. Very true. And, you know, I, I think the easiest way to explain the two differences is that socialism is the dictatorship of the proletariat. It is the system of absolute control of, you know, of everything by the government. Right. It is the system, right? And it's a system of what Lenin called the state capitalist monopoly, where the state controls every single part of the capitalist system, which is ironic because most socialists think, hey, doesn't it get rid of capitalism? It doesn't get rid of capitalism. It, it seizes control of everything you don't like and maintains it. <laughs> That's right. And then makes it worse because right. it subsidizes the problems. It doesn't get rid of anything yeah. you think it's going to get rid of. I don't, you know, I think if you can explain that to some of these people who don't like capitalism, look, you know, the interventionist policies are what keep these zombie systems alive that shouldn't otherwise collapse. You want to have a dishonest company, let it fall. You're great. That's how the that's how the normal economic system works. That's right. You want to bring in the interventionist policies into the capitalist system. That's where you have problems, and that's caused by socialism. Yeah. You know. No question about it. And you and you see, um, it's interesting because the socialists historically, going all the way back to Karl Marx, but modern day socialists, you see this all the time. The focus is always on, there's so much power. We're giving all this power. Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest thing that's uh, historically with socialism is they're so concerned about um, the centralization of power in the, with corporations. That's where they see this pr big problem that exists, this, this oligarchy. And the, the, Bernie Sanders talks about all the time that the, the wealth is concentrated in the hands of this small group of people. But their solution is to take that power and, away from the, oh, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and people like that and put it in the hands of the government, which is another group of a relatively small group of people where they're centralizing all of the power so they're just all they're doing in their own minds is taking one small group of people and exchanging it for another small group of people except the difference is that Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos the owner of Amazon can do to me is, is cancel my Amazon subscription right or cancel my Microsoft 365 subscription or something but what can the government do the government can throw you in prison. The government can take away your rights. The government can tax you and target you and do all kinds of terrible things to you. So what is worse, having some uh, wealth controlled by a relatively small group of people, but you have all of your other freedoms, or having the government in charge of everything, which is essentially what they're all calling for. For some reason, they trust the government more than they trust just regular people to have their own rights. It just, it's, it's not even logical. Yeah, well, and, and to make it more bizarre, guys like Jeff Bezos and these big corporate oligarchs right. that we have support socialism. Right. Why, why in the world would they support socialism? And I, I, I'd say I think I know the reason. 
because it, socialism subsidizes the problems. Yes. Socialism gives them, you know, the interventionist policies subsidize all the problems of their industries. Yeah. You know, they can stay on as the chairs of a collectivist con uh, company and still run it just the same. Exactly. The only difference is, is you know, if they, they do something wrong, the, the companies don't collapse. You know, the taxpayer dollars will keep them afloat. Yeah. Right? Yeah, there's no and question look, about it. You cannot like, people cannot like, you know, capitalism all they want. Name one communist slash socialist country that got rid of big business. Yeah. Soviet Union, they kept it. Yep. Communist China, they kept it. Even North Korea has a huge black market industry that they maintain. Right. Not a single one of them gets rid of it. Yeah. The, the one that maybe did was Cambodia because they didn't have, <laughs> they didn't have it. They were an agrarian society. Right. You know what I mean? And what, they killed a third of the population exactly. and even, even without having that? Exactly. And so, you know, look, it doesn't get rid of it. No. It doesn't get rid of it. I think a lot of, a lot of people who think they believe in socialism, I would argue that a lot of them don't actually believe in socialism. Correct. I'd argue that most of them are actually just good-hearted people who, who've been brainwashed to believe that, that somehow it's going to get rid of all these problems, which it does not, and which we've seen over and over again that it does not. And, you know, they've been told that it represents this, yeah, fight against the big powers, when in reality, it is the opposite of what it says it is. It, it represents that big centralized power, as you just explained. That's exactly right, yeah. And, and I think for so many people, socialism is basically, in their minds, it's charity. It's a form of charity. And they think of it like charity. And so when anyone opposes it, they think, basically, you're just a heartless person who doesn't care about helping poor people. It's, the, it's always about helping poor people, as though this is some kind of form of charity. But in order for it to be charity, there has to be voluntary choice. I have to choose to help these people. I don't have any choices under this current system. The way it works is they come in, they take my money away from me, they decide what to do with the money, they decide who to help, and most of it ends up going into the bureaucracy and it gets lost and it doesn't end up helping anybody anyway. So it's not charity, it's always force, coercion, and manipulation, no matter what. No matter how you structure it, that's what it is. I'm all for charity, I'm all for helping people who are down and out. But in order for me to do that, I have to voluntarily choose to do that. Right now, I can't even choose to do that because 35, 40% of everything I make goes away, goes to the government anyway. If I, had the, if I had any of my own money to give away, maybe I would be able to do that. But I can't because it's all going to some government bureaucrat somewhere. Yeah, well, and here, here's the thing, too, is people talk about liberalism and these kinds of things. There's nothing wrong with liberalism. Liberalism, though, is misinterpreted as something it does not originally mean. Right. Liberalism was the belief in liberty, right? right. The, cl the classical liberals like Frederick Bastiat and, you know, uh, you know Ludwig von Mises, for example. These, these guys were fantastic. Yes. I, you know, I think they're great. You want to talk about real liberalism? These guys were good. These guys were good people, and they opposed socialism. Yes. Because socialism stands against the ideas of liberty that liberalism is based on. Right. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And and I would say a lot of my friends who think they're socialists, I'd tell them, no, you're. I I know what they believe in. They don't believe in mass centralized power and government running everything in your life. They don't believe in you know government tyranny and gulags and these kinds of things, right, which is what socialism in full practice does, you know, it does represent. No, they, they believe they believe in liberty and classical liberalism. That's right. But they, they've been convinced that somehow this other system represents yeah. that. And I think that maybe the biggest problem uh, related to that point is that so many people have been convinced that uh, Scandinavian countries are perfect little socialist utopias. So because you and I will talk about all these failed socialist states. We have dozens of examples of them. We could talk about it all day long. But a hundred countries and a hundred yeah, years I mean, and a hundred million ex, dead ex, at least. I mean, yeah, at, least ex, at least, right? And yeah. so we could talk about it all day long, all the failures. But then the left has pointed to these five or so relatively small countries that exist in a part of the world that basically nobody ever goes to. No one knows anything about these countries. And then they call them socialist countries. And then they say that these countries, despite the fact that many of the leaders of these countries themselves have said, no, we are not socialist. No, 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 they hate it. They hate it. <laughs> yeah. They ignore that. They, and, they keep saying, yeah, Bert, stop, stop exactly. calling us socialist. We have every element of a free market right, economy. Exactly. <laughs> they are not even remotely close to a socialist society. I mean, in some of these countries, if you look at like the Heritage Foundation, Cato Institute, they put out world freedom rankings every year or so. 
Um, these countries rank pretty much in line with the United States every single year. Um, these countries have l fewer regulations in many cases. In some places they have school choice. In other places, they, um, they, they not only do they have more business freedom and things like that, but their tax system is actually less progressive. They tax, the taxes is really, that they have very high tax rates, but everybody has to pay them. Poor people are taxed at 25, 30% in these places. They have balanced budgets. They have a trillion dollar sovereign wealth fund in Norway that they got from drilling oil. I mean, does that sound like the modern Democratic Party's platform right now? Balanced budgets, less regulations, uh, having a trillion dollars sitting in the bank? I mean, of course not. Yeah, some don't even have, like, uh, minimum wage, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they have... They... And, and who would have thought that getting rid of min minimum wage would raise minimum wages, <laughs> yeah. right? Yes. You'd think that these interventionist policies exactly. would, you know... So what they've done is they've taken the fact that they have some socialized industries and they've used that as proof of their whole societies are social societies and look at how great they've, that they are because they have single payer healthcare or something. And they ignore all the other free market elements of their economies, like the fact that they have entrepreneurs, the fact that they, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. And here's the big thing too, a lot of these countries started bringing in socialism exactly. and then stopped. Exactly. A, lot of, a lot of their prosperity comes from before they tried socialist policies. And, you know, they've maintained it because they rolled it back, not because they went more into it. That's right. Yeah, they've actually reversed many of the policies that they started putting into place 40, 50 years ago or so. And once they started reversing those policies, their economy started to improve again. Um, they had they had some they went through some really tough times in some of these Scandinavian countries in like the 1980s or so. And it was because they had adopted all these socialist policies and they realized, you know what, this isn't working. Let's reverse course and do something else. That's exactly what they did. And their economies have improved as a result of it. Their corporate tax rates in these countries were much lower than the corporate tax rate here in the United States uh, up until we just passed our Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And now they're basically in line with us. So again, we have the, we have the, the Nordic model in we practice. Have the Nor yeah, we're, I mean, we're, we, that was literally <laughs> adopting the Nordic corporate tax structure. So the, I, the again, the idea that they're, when Bernie Sanders or Alexander Ocasio-Cortez or someone like that says, we just want to be like them. It's a lie. They don't want to be like them. They, they want maybe a couple of the things that they do, but they want to ignore all the free market elements that they, and then, then call them socialists, even though they say they're not. It's And even, even though by definition they're not, you could say they have some socialist programs. And we have some socialist programs in America. I mean, there isn't a country on earth that doesn't have some socialist program or a socialist industry or something. We have public roads. Right? So are you telling me that if you have public roads and everything else is free market, you're a socialist country? Of course not. No one would say that. Um, so clearly, uh, they're not socialist countries by any measurement at all. They're much more like us, really, in, in many respects. And even the parts where they, and they're not better off than us either. And that's the, the other thing. I mean, they're co they have very high taxes. The cost of living is very, very high there. The cost of housing is way higher than here. And their pay is lower. So who wants to live under that model anyway? I mean, I don't, I don't want that. And they have no choice when it comes to certain things like colleges, for instance, they have very few educational opportunities relative to what we have in the United States. Um, healthcare is a great example of it. They have single payer healthcare systems. So um, if you have a really serious problem, unless you can afford the extra private health insurance option and you can go travel someplace else or you know whatever, you're not gonna get the good healthcare uh, that you get here in the United States on certain kinds of problems. Yeah, and as we're seeing now, you, you get you know year-long wait times. Exactly. And then if, if you have an illness the government doesn't want to treat or you need to be treated for too long, well, they can decide that you need to die with dignity. That's right. You know, That's right. Sorry, buddy. Sorry. Time, time to die with dignity. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's, it's very true. You know, they had a, um, I loved this. In, in the United Kingdom, they have great stories about the rationing. I mean, it's just a disaster. I, mean, I shouldn't laugh. When it's I it's actually pretty you know, terrible. No, it is. Yeah. It's, tr it's very yeah. tragic. But it, it, in the United Kingdom, they recently rolled out this idea, two just brilliant ideas. One was they didn't have enough primary care doctors treating people with chronic illnesses like diabetes and stuff like that. So they decided what they want to do is roll out this program where instead of going and meeting with your doctor individually, you, we should start meeting with doctors in groups of 15 people. So it'd be like group 
therapy sessions almost, except now you're being treated for your diabetes in this group session. And I just thought to myself, yeah, can you imagine going to one of these group sessions and you want to talk about, I don't know, your erectile dysfunction or something, and you're going to have to have uh, uh, have this conversation in front of 15 different people? I mean, Maybe women present I mean, yeah, as well. I mean, come on, this is nuts. And then the other one they did was they had this rationing of a particular drug that was being used for in vitro fertilization, so people, couples who were having trouble having kids. And because they didn't have enough of it, they had to decide who, how they were going to ration this. So what they decided was they were going to base it on the BMI, the body mass index, basically how fat you are, on not of the women, because that would be very offensive, so they chose the men. So they said the potential fathers, if your BMI was too high, then you couldn't get this in vitro fertilization drug that was being used to help you have a child. So b literally, they were saying, you're too fat to be a dad. I mean, that was the policy. Well, th and there you go. That's, that's socialized medicine at work. Some people get it, some people don't, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly right. You don't, you, you don't have a say in it anymore. Exactly. Yeah. No, no, no ability to make those decisions. You, you talk about socialism as evil, and you talk about the moral element of it. Explain this to our viewers. Right. So I, uh, I believe that socialism, even if, and we've been talking a lot about how it doesn't function well, even if it could function well, I believe it's evil. It's a highly immoral system. And the reason for that is predominantly because in socialism, you cannot have freedom of conscience or freedom of religion. It is impossible. And the reason for that is because... It talks about that in the actual doctrine, that it, it aims to destroy these. Exactly. And the Communist manifesto. Communism destroys all religion and all morality. Yes, and the reason for that is because if you have a collectivist society where decisions are being made by the collective, whether that's democratically or somebody at the top is making it for the collective or whatever, it doesn't really matter. The point is you don't have any options. So there has to be a decision. So for, an, for example, if you live in a single-payer healthcare society, a society with single-payer healthcare, and that, that majority of people in that society decide, you know what, we want to pay for abortion, we want to have abortion. If that's against your, everybody in that society is going to have to contribute to it. Everyone's going to have to pay for it. And if, even if it's against your religious beliefs, it doesn't matter if it's against your religious beliefs. You have to contribute to it. And the same is true for almost anything, anything you're socializing. If you're socializing the agricultural part of a society, which is very common historically in socialist and communist countries, well, what do you do with Hindus or uh, vegetarians or people who don't believe in killing animals for meat? What if a majority of people in that society decide, yes, we're going to kill animals for meat? What if you are a person who doesn't believe in uh, uh, consuming alcohol products. You're going to become a part owner of every alcohol distillery in the country if you have a socialized agricultural system. Yeah, and they can talk all they want about freedom of choice. Choice goes both ways. That's the definition of choice. That's support. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, you want, you, you're stripping people of their ability to choose what they want to support and not support. Exactly. And by doing that, you're forcing people to violate their religious beliefs. Or, or freedom of conscience. That's exactly right. And you, and you even have it in countries like you know China, where you talk about abortion, you don't have a choice. Right. If you know under the when they had the you know one child policy, they they would kill your second child yeah. if you had one without government permission. That's exactly right. I mean, that yeah. how is that freedom of choice? Yeah. Well, in the Soviet Union, you know, if you read the Soviet Union Constitution, which is a really interesting document, <clears throat> there's all sorts of there are all sorts of uh, parts of the Soviet Union Constitution where they talk about individual rights freedom of religion, uh, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom of association, it's all there. And, yeah. and then a bunch of other same freedoms same too. too. They, they, yeah. they can talk about it, they don't enforce it. it. Yes, yeah. but then there's also this little clause in the Constitution that says none, no citizen's individual rights should supersede the benefits, get in the way of the benefits, what's being conceived as the good of the collective, yeah. right? So you have rights, but only if that doesn't get in the way of what's good for the collective, well, which and, is another and, way of and, saying and you the, don't have any rights. And that's, a, that, and that's you, you can, you know, people say they don't like fascism. That is a fascist principle. That was Mussolini said, right? That we will have a society where people no longer have the antisocial right to rebel against the interests of the collective. <laughs> right. The whole fascisty concept, concept was collectivism. It's all right. Right? It, I mean, you want to, this, this is where I think people get stuck. 
Yeah. You want to talk about you know individualism and individual rights and individual liberties? That is not socialism. Socialism is the exact opposite of that. Yeah, even diversity. We hear about diversity from the left all the time. They love diversity. Socialism is anti-diversity in every way. There can't be diversity in socialism. It's flattening of society and it's forcing everyone to conform with one little cookie cutter mold. Exactly. Right? And who decides what the cookie cutter mold should be, right? It's imposed on you and that's and that's why it, no matter how you look at this, it's so important when you're talking about socialism, especially with younger people, to make those arguments. The economic arguments are important, the history of failure is important, but it's more important to say to them, do you want to be a tyrant? Do you want to impose your beliefs on other people? Do you really want to force other people to go along with whatever you think is right? Do you want other people to get together and force you to go along with what they think is right? I mean, at their core, I don't think anyone wants to admit that they have a tyrannical streak in them, right? And so if you have that conversation with them, it's hard for them to, to say, yeah, actually, I do want to force these people over here to do it. Even if that's what they really want, it's hard for them to admit it. And I think that's a really important way of talking to them about it. Right. I guess just the la last minute, you know, um, I guess what, what do you hope people take away on this? You know, what, if you were to tell a young person today, you know, okay, socialism is bad. I know you've been hearing all this time that Bernie Sanders says it's going to, you know, fight against the, the millionaires and billionaires. Ironically, he's a millionaire, but <laughs> yes, let's not talk about that for a minute, right? If fight against the millionaires right. and the billionaires. Right. What, do, what do you tell them? Yeah, I, I think the, the two things, the most important things that you can tell them is, number one, this has been tried so many times. If it was going to work, it would have worked by now. We have a long history of failure. More than 167 million people have been exiled, imprisoned, or killed by socialist and communist parties over the past 100 years on every continent where there are human beings. There's a reason for that. And we're seeing that same tyranny crop up again. Exactly. And the second thing, even if somehow magically we could defy all of history and logic and make that work, it would still be highly immoral. You're still imposing your beliefs on the beliefs of other people. You're still forcing other people to violate their deeply held ethical beliefs, whether those are religious or not religious. And that's an essential part of any socialist model. It has to be that way. You can't get around it. Because getting around it would mean there's choices. You can't have choices in a socialist model. That's the whole point. And I think those are the two most important ideas when you're talking to younger people. Real pleasure having yeah, you on the great. show. Thank you. Thanks. Everyone, please remember to like and subscribe. See you next time.